Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Today's episode is the second and final part of a two-part episode on fabricating a preamplifier for the Shure PG48 dynamic microphone. I'll review the design that I created in KiCad, show in detail how I fabricated the printed circuit board, discuss two mistakes that I made and how I recovered from them, and lastly, demonstrate how well the completed project works. So the next step in the project of this microphone preamp is to make the printed circuit board. And I have here the artwork that I printed on a laser printer. We're gonna use the toner transfer method to make the printed circuit board. So let's spend a few minutes in KiCad and see how I generated this. Here's the printed circuit board schematic that I laid out in KiCad. It follows Andy Collinson's design exactly, which is the one exception. That's the ferrite bead that I mentioned in my prior video that I had to add to reduce the stray RF noise. The rest of the circuit choices are pretty simple. I did pick vertical component footprints for just about all of the resistors and capacitors with the exception of just one, as you'll see in the next uh, shot. I typically will put the resistors uh, horizontal, but in this case, I wanted to uh, save as much board space as possible and make this compact. So along with using a radial lead capacitors, vertically mounting the resistors does save a lot of space. And the other comment I would make, the library that's in KiCad does have on most through-hole components an option for hand solder. In particular, these TO92 transistors have a very nice hand solder footprint. It gives quite a bit more copper than you'd get with the conventional footprints, and it does make the soldering a lot easier. Next, let's look at the layout. So I was able to fit this entire circuit on a 51 millimeter by 27 millimeter footprint. There's nothing magical about that size. It's just basically the small size that I could comfortably fit all the traces in. The, the trace width that I like to use when I'm making my own boards is about 0.8 millimeters. That gives a good balance between trying to keep clearance small between components and other traces and yet make the traces big enough that I don't have very many instances where the toner transfer leaves a break in the trace and then I have to, uh, to patch the, 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 the finished product with a solder bridge or a piece of wire or something. So 0 0.8 seems to work pretty well. And again, you can see I've used a lot of vertical components, again, to save on space and to keep things compact. And here's that one resistor I mentioned that I did make horizontal where there is a trace that goes from one side of the resistor to the other. Just a common trick to use when you're trying to avoid having a convoluted routing or worse than that, have a jumper wire that you've got to put in. So old trick and it works quite well. Okay, and last item to look at in KiCad here is the 3D preview. I really like this feature. I use this a lot going back and forth between when I'm doing the trace layouts and going to 3D view just to kind of see how things are shaping up. Of course, you gotta keep in mind that the component heights are generally not gonna be correct and that's fine. I'm not trying to do a full three-dimensional uh, Z height correct layout here, mostly just to see how the component spacings look. And obviously you can see most of the components, uh, the resistors, uh, I should say, are vertical and that helps save a lot on board space. Obviously the model for the Ferrari B, that's not correct, but that doesn't really matter. I just wanted something that was gonna have appropriate lead to lead spacing and pretty close in diameter. And then of course, it's, this is an excellent way to check out the uh, ground plane and spacing of anything else that you've, you put on the board and look for errors where the ground plane may have some discontinuities or thin sections. Generally, I like to keep a ground plane that's continuous all the way around the perimeter, but in this case, I did uh, tuck in the, the input connectors over, or connections rather, over on the, the, the corner, and that meant there's one small section of ground plane connection that goes through the center of the capacitor uh, leads, but I'm not too concerned about that. This is audio, not RF, so there isn't quite as much burden with a ground plane as you would have with RF. So. I think this looks good, so next up, I'll be fabricating this board and getting it running. I've laser printed the artwork in 32 pound glossy paper, and because this is toner transfer, it's really not that sharp. If you zoom in, which I'll do here in a moment, you can see just how fuzzy the printing is 
and that can be a problem where you get uh, traces that don't stick well. And other tip here, since this is the back copper, when you print this from KeyCAD, make sure that you print it not mirrored, but when you lay it out, you're gonna have to mirror any text or logos like I've done with my logo here for it to show up correctly. Here's the printed circuit board that I'm using. It's just a scrap piece of FR4, single-sided material, 1.6 mil thick, although you could use thinner material and it would work fine. And I always start with a piece that's a little bit bigger than the final size. And what I do next is I use my calipers to lightly score the copper surface to the final size. And that's probably not the recommended best use for a caliper, but this really does work well. You can dial it and set it to the exact amount or the exact distance that you're trying to size the board to. And just don't push hard. Remember, uh, keep in mind, you're not trying to cut through the board. You're just trying to make a score line so you know where to cut it later. And another tip, a lot of these pieces don't have necessarily the straightest edges all the way around. So when you're working with a scrap piece, just look and see which were the, the straightest edges, the corner that was closest to 90. And just, just use that as your reference and cut and score off of those edges and you'll get close enough. For cutting the board, I like to use tin snips. It provides a much cleaner cut than using a saw or a Dremel, uh, mainly because it generates very little dust or debris, and it provides a, a nice sharp uh, edge, nice crisp edge when you're done. So just one tip, make sure you don't squeeze the tin snips all the way closed. If you do that with this material, you might crack it as the, as the tip uh, comes completely closed. And then I only cut one side, I'll cut the other side later. Next, I use a file to clean up the edges. In this case, I'm putting the shavings right in the trash. Uh, no need to try to clean those up later. It's important to do this because when you run this board through the laminator, those rollers are elastomers and they will get gouged by the sharp edge of the PC board. So you wanna make sure you break that edge off. And the filing also removes any loose pieces of fiberglass. And just keep in mind, you don't need a chamfer there. You're just trying to get rid of any sharp edges or debris that was hanging on. After filing, the next step is to get the surface ready for maximum adhesion of the toner transfer method. And to do that, you need to scuff up the surface of the copper and get up, rid of all the oxides. What I like to use is 4-0 steel wool. It's very fine. It's similar to Scotch-Brite or ultra-fine sandpaper, but what really works best is you need to scuff it left, right, up and down, and in circle uh, pattern. And what you'll end up with if you have it polished correctly or cleaned up correctly is a surface that looks like this. You can see it's very reflective and there are very fine scratches in there, but that'll help with the adhesion. In this case, I've got a couple score marks. There's one right there that's for the cutting later and that second one hopefully is not going to be an issue when I make the board. All right, now that I have the clean printed circuit board and the cut artwork ready to go, the next step is to use the laminator to transfer the toner particles from the glossy paper to the surface of the copper. And one step that I did off camera is to clean this copper with a little bit of brake cleaner. That's usually a good solvent to use. It doesn't leave any residues behind. And of course, be very careful not to touch the board after you've got it clean. Here I'm laminating the circuit board and there's nothing fancy about this process or the equipment. It's just a stock laminator you can get. It's about any office supply house. A couple tricks though, you do want to run the board through about a dozen times and make sure you flip it around a couple times, run it through forwards and backwards. If it's a larger board, even run it through at a 45 degree angle and you're trying to get good compaction and, and make sure you get every bit of that powder to bond. And of course use gloves, it's a hot process and uh, you'll burn your hands otherwise. Next process is to remove the paper, and that's really easy. You just soak it in water for a few minutes. And I've sped this up, kind of jumped to the conclusion here, but what'll happen is the paper will absorb the water, and the toner, since it's now bonded to the surface of the copper, stays behind. And as I slowly peel this off, you can see there it is. All that toner is transferred and it's stuck onto the surface of the copper now. Now, I do use a piece of uh, masking tape to help keep the a paper uh, aligned for the first part of the process. Now that what that'll do is it'll be a little region there usually that doesn't separate right away, but that's easy enough. Just put it back in the water, let it soak for a moment and it'll come right off. And then as you take the board out, you can see there's all the traces. Here's a close up of what the board looks like after I take it out of the water and it dries for a little bit. There is a little bit of white residue from the paper that's left behind and you don't need to worry about that. The uh, residue doesn't interfere with the next step, the etching. And second, there are a few spots that didn't fully transfer, and that happens. You can't always get a perfect transfer. 
So just do a quick magnification like I'm doing, look for those and just touch those up with a Sharpie and it'll be fine. I use ferric chloride as the etchant. I know some guys like to use a hydrogen peroxide acid base, but ferric chloride, ferric chloride works quite well. That said, it is a hazardous chemical. It's an acid. You have to use the precautions that are necessary to be safe with this. And if you are doing so, you're doing it at your own risk. Now, a couple of tips that I prefer. I have an old glass container, a Pyrex container that works very well for containing the, the ferric chloride. I do heat it um, using a, a bucket of hot water. I put the container of the ferric, ferric chloride in there for about 20 minutes beforehand. And that warms it up just enough to make it work noticeably faster. But that said, it still takes about five to seven minutes uh, for a half ounce copper board to, to etch. And then of course, gently agitate the solution helps speed it along too. You need to check it periodically to see when it's done. And you can tell when it's finished, of course, when any of the copper that wasn't covered by the toner transfer is etched away. And as you can see here, you shine a light through it. In this case, it's a single-sided board. It's very easy to see when it's done. Uh, you won't see any areas of, of bare copper or the light will come through tran translucently and you'll know you've got a finished board. Removing the toner from the board is real easy. I just use a little bit of acetone and it comes right off. There are other solvents that, that will work just as well, but I happen to have acetone, so that's what I use. I'm ready to drill the through holes through the printed circuit board, and I have a small drill press here. It's a very inexpensive model, nothing fancy. You just need something that's going to provide stability because this bit is only 0.8 millimeters in diameter. If you try to drill these holes with a hand drill or the Dremel, you're just going to break bits, so you need this kind of stability. And then, of course, a sacrificial piece of wood helps to have a level platform to keep the board steady as you're sliding it around and drilling the different holes. A few tips on aligning such a small drill bit. So generally, you can see the reflection of the drill bit as it comes down to the copper, and you can use that as a visual uh, cue to get best alignment. And then for me, I use magnifiers. <laughs> my vision isn't as good as it was when I was in my teens. After drilling, there's burrs around each of the holes. So before I go to the next step where I'm going to put the tin coating on there, I like to take a piece of 800 grit sandpaper and just lightly go over the surface of the copper and get rid of those burrs. That's much smoother and it's ready to be cleaned one more time, um, I will run it through a quick wash with some of the uh, brake cleaner and then I'll put the uh, Electrolyst tin plating on there. The next step is to put the tin coating on the board and I'm gonna play this in slow motion because it's just so cool to watch. You pour the liquid onto the copper and almost instantly it reacts with the surface and you get a thin coating of tin. This tin coating makes a big difference for keeping the board stable for a long time and not oxidize and greatly improves solderability. So um, if you were looking really closely at the PC board after I put the tin plating on it, you would have seen there was a little corner of copper that's missing. And there's a story behind that. So a couple things didn't go quite as planned. The first thing that um, didn't work right was the tin plating. I actually have my own solution that I brewed up. It's on uh, Nerd Rage's channel. It's pretty easy to make. And one caveat about it is he wasn't sure what the shelf life of that stuff is. Well, I found out the hard way. It's less than six months because I've used it several months ago and it was fine. But when I tried it this time, it ended up leaving a dark grayish, almost blackish brown finish on the copper. To me, that's most likely sulfides, either tin, tin sulfide or, or copper sulfide. Definitely not what I want on the board for solderability. So I had to remove that. Now, pretty easy to, to remove it. Just go back and lightly sand it. And that's when I made my second mistake. I pushed a little too hard on that corner and I actually sanded the copper off. So, but I don't think it's gonna be a big issue. I think I can put a little jumper around that area and still use the board. So project goes on. And here's the finished assembled board. So a couple comments about the resistors. I like to orient these so the tolerance bands are nearest the PC board. That just makes it easier and more consistent for me to read the values later when I'm troubleshooting. And then there's a choice about the exposed lead. You know which part of the circuit that you put that on. And what I like to do is if there's a ground on one end of the resistor, then that's the exposed lead. If there's B plus, then that's not the exposed lead. That way, if I'm uh, doing some troubleshooting, I don't accidentally short something out. And looking at the circuit, if there's a sensitive end of the resistor, such as the base of a transistor, then that's not the exposed lead just to prevent antenna effects or other noise from being picked up. 
And here's the back side of the board. You can see the jumper solution that I came up with to fix the sanded off trace that I accidentally created. If you look at the rest of my soldering, I'm certainly not gonna win any IPC class three awards for it, but it's good enough for this application. And then I also do use a RA flux and a flux pin to help with soldering. And I remove that when I'm done with lacquer thinner. And lastly, you can see the pockmarked appearance of the board, especially in the ground plane areas. It's definitely a side effect of the transfer method, the toner transfer method. All right, here's the finished printed circuit board. I've reconnected it to the microphone, the potentiometer, and the battery, and I'll demonstrate it working. What I did off camera here before I connected the battery was to check that there weren't any shorts or open circuits in the uh, connections on the printed circuit board, and that's just as simple as taking the meter on ohms mode and checking from B plus to ground on the board and looking um, for any ab abnormalities there. That's a quick and easy check. The other thing I did while I had the multimeter connected was to check the current. And when I did connect the battery, it was drawing around three milliamps. If you recall, that matches the current that I expected back in the prior video, so that's good. So what I'll do here to try to make it easier for you guys to hear the sound, I'll take my lapel mic off and I've got my GE Musophonic radio connected again to the phono input. I've set uh, just by ear a gain value on the potentiometer and try to record what it actually sounds like coming through the radio. So here we go. Turn up the volume on the radio, or on the, uh, the radio control rather, and here we go. This is my voice coming through the phono input on the GE radio, and it sounds pretty good. So to get this project wrapped up, the next and last step I'm going to do is get the circuit board packaged in the aluminum enclosure and show how I'm actually going to set this up for recording my voiceovers. Okay, so the next step in the project is the mechanical construction. And what I'm showing here are all the various parts I've gathered from the junk box to put this into an enclosure and get all the interconnects set up. If you recall from the prior video, I was trying to decide between using this Drake High Pass TV filter that is decades old. It's a nice little enclosure, doesn't really have any value nowadays. The problem is it's just too small. By the time I got everything together and laid it out, I just realized you know it's not all gonna fit. So my second choice is this uh, Hammond aluminum box, and it's actually a leftover from a prior project of mine, my spectrum analyzer, and I have a filter in there. It's a 110 megahertz band pass filter, and it just didn't work right. Learned some, some nice lessons from, from building this, but I set it aside, and this will work perfectly. It's just about the right size for everything to fit in here. I did a just a quick layout of putting everything in there, and I think it's gonna work fine. So the the other thing that I decided to do is how to support the, the microphone and also in the junk box I had this microphone uh, support, flexible arm support, and it's just about the right size and the way that I'm going to attach this is just to drill some holes and put some mounting screws on the top of this cover and then just to use a clamp over on this side to attach it temporarily to my my desk or my workbench like right here whatever I'm doing voiceovers and I think that'll work just fine. I finished the assembly of the microphone preamp and everything just barely fit in the Hammond box. It's a little tight but it turned out okay. A couple things I had to do though uh, the potentiometer the shaft was too long so what I did is just mark it to the length I felt was needed for this small knob and I took the potentiometer over to my small miniature lathe, chucked it in the lathe and very slowly and carefully turned off the excess length and then it fit in there just fine. Um, a couple other adjustments that I made to the design. One was I decided that I would wire this for line level output. One of the things I saw in the testing was that this amplifier has so much gain that I don't think it's gonna work for a microphone input so I've got a stereo jack here and I just wire this so that uh, both outputs that's the blue wire uh, go to the left and the right channel inputs and I'll just hook this up on the line level for my computer and just adjust the gain with the potentiometer to what will work for that. I um, also did add an LED and I put in a fairly large dropping resistor it's a I think it's a 4.7 K that I put in there and I checked that with a multimeter just to see what the current draws. And it was just less than a the milliamp. Remember, the whole circuit only draws about three milliamps. And if I use like a uh, 330 ohm or, or 470 ohm 
resistor, the LED would be a lot brighter, but it would draw almost three amps. And I certainly don't want to have just that much power going to, to light up an indicator. So it is bright enough, to, just bright enough to be able to see it and let me know that the circuit's on. So I think that'll work just fine. Another change that I made was to put the mounting for the microphone in the center of the cover. I went back and forth a bit about whether I should have it centered or have it offset, but I think it looks better centered and there's still plenty of room on the side here to put a clamp to hold it down. On the bottom I attached some rubber feet just to keep it from uh, sliding around and get uh, the screws elevated enough so that they wouldn't scratch anything. And these are pretty old. The uh, self-adhesive uh, on there, the pressure sensitive adhesive had long stop working but I found just using a little bit of hot melt more is more than adequate to stick these on and uh, hold them on uh, very tightly. And here's the finished product attached to my desk. I did buy a cheap pop filter from Amazon and I'm using one of my woodworking clamps to hold it to my desk but it's pretty small footprint as you can see. Uh, the cable comes out the back of course and goes right into the input jack in the front of the PC and it's easy to set up and take down when I'm done recording dialogue. I'm quite happy with the setup. This is the raw audio that I've been recording from my lapel mic. And I'm trying to use at least a simple graphic equalizer here in Windows Media Player to give some idea and give some visual representation of the sound energy coming from this. And as you can see, most of the tone is in the middle of the spectrum. Also, I've used a 20 dB microphone boost and a plus 12 dB microphone gain. So quite a bit of gain just to even get to this level and unfortunately that's also boosting a lot of noise. If you listen to the quiet sections between my sentences you can really hear that hiss. Now let's see what the new preamp sounds like when I use it with the Shure microphone. And here we go. This is the preamp working with the Shure dynamic microphone. The recording definitely sounds much more like my natural voice. It's richer. There's a deeper tone to it. It may not be easy to tell from the spectrum analyzer display from Windows Media Player. <laughs> I'm sure it's not a very frequency accurate display, so that's kind of disappointing. But nonetheless, I trust my ears. This sounds better than the lapel mic that I've been using, and I can't wait to use this going forward for all my soundtracks on my future videos. So as part of my closing for this episode, what I thought I would do is record the audio both with the microphone preamp and with the lavalier lapel mic uh, through the camcorder. And what I'll do at some point here, I'll just switch the audio back and forth so you can tell the difference. And one of the problems I'm still having with getting my channel up and running is this um, lapel mic is way too hot for this camera. It's an old Sony camcorder. And even though I've got the level set pretty low, it still overdrives it. And you can probably notice the distortion a lot of times when I'm using it. So that'll be something to work on in the future. So what I'll do at this point, I'll switch the audio over to that lapel mic so you can see just how it compares to the audio that I'm recording through the microphone uh, preamp with the Shure microphone. So definitely like using this, uh, but as you can see, it's kind of awkward to use for video um, uh, capture because the mic has to be so close and it, I don't have to get very far away from the mic for the audio to start to drop off. And that's to be expected. This is something you're supposed to sing into or keep close to your face when you're speaking. It's not really uh, a more modern uh, condenser type microphone made for uh, blogging use and whatnot. But as part of the spirit of the Level Up Double E Lab is making uh, interesting and fun things from stuff that you have on hand and trying to expand knowledge. And in this case, uh, I worked off of a circuit that was already uh, published. And once again, I want to thank uh, Andy Collinson for that excellent idea. It worked well. And I will post a link to his work uh, in the bottom of this video again. So thanks again, Andy. And um, lastly, keep watching for future videos to come out and click that like button and be sure to subscribe to get updates. Thanks and bye for now.